Okay, so you want to get into glioblastoma treatment. Yeah, let's do it. All right, we're going deep on this one. We're talking dendritic cell vaccines. Oh, yeah. You've heard of them, right? Definitely. Maybe even seen the hype, but we're going way beyond the headlines today. We've got two really fascinating sources. Okay. One is this dense research study, mm -hmm. and the other one dies into a specific vaccine trial. Okay, cool. And, uh, and when I say dense, I mean dense. All right. So let's do it. Buckle up. Yeah. But it's worth it. Yeah. I mean, the potential here is genuinely groundbreaking. It really is. Yeah. We're talking about a whole new way to think about fighting this disease. Absolutely. So imagine this. Okay. Your immune system. Mm -hmm. It's like a security team, right? Okay. But they're new on the job. They don't quite know who the bad guys are yet. Right. Dendritic cells. They're like the security chief. Okay. Training the rest of the team to recognize glioblastoma cells as the enemy. That's a great analogy because it really is like you're training these cells what to look for and oh. how to attack them. Yes. And what's so fascinating is these vaccines, they basically give the security chief a really detailed file on the enemy. You know, oh, wow. how to spot them, what their weaknesses are. Oh, that's cool. They prime the immune system to be incredibly precise. I love that. In its attack. Okay, I love that analogy. Oh. So this first study we dug into, yeah. we keep calling it Study A. Study A. Because it's got a crazy long name. Of course. Yeah. But um, yeah. they were testing out this way to make the training even more effective. Like you say, giving those security guards night vision goggles. Right. Using something called TLR agonists. So TLR agonists are really interesting because what they do is they essentially press the high alert button on your immune cells. Okay. So they amplify the signal that there's a threat Got it. that needs to be dealt with. And in this case, those glioblastoma cells. Okay. So they supercharge the immune response. Exactly. But here's where it gets really interesting. Okay. The researchers looked at blood samples from the patients who got this dendritic cell vaccine plus the TLR agonists. Uh -huh. And they found this significant increase in something called ISGs. Right. And this is key. Yes, ISGs are like the weapons uh -huh. your immune system uses to fight off these invaders. Cool. And specifically, these interferon-stimulated genes help to control tumor growth. So finding more of them after the vaccine and the TLR agonist combo, mm -hmm. that's a really good sign. That's a really promising sign. That the treatment's working Yeah. on like a fundamental level. Absolutely. And, you know, we're talking about a disease here where even slowing down the tumor's growth can be a major victory. Yeah, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Because glioblastoma is aggressive. Mm -hmm. And what's so encouraging here is that study A suggests this combination approach might give the immune system a real fighting chance yeah. to keep that tumor in check yeah. for a longer period of time. Which brings us to source B. Okay. So this one looked at a specific dendritic cell vaccine called DCVAX-L. Okay. Now, this trial had a really unique twist. Oh, really? They actually offered the vaccine to patients in the placebo group if their disease got worse. It's called a crossover design. Yeah. And it throws a bit of a wrench yeah. into things from a data analysis standpoint. Yeah. But ethically, yeah. it's completely understandable. Yeah. You, you can't deny someone a potentially life-saving treatment just because they were initially randomized to a control group. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. But I'm curious, how do you even begin to interpret the results when almost everyone eventually receives the treatment? Right. It seems like it would be nearly impossible to figure out how much the benefit is from the vaccine itself. It gets messy. It really does. Yeah. And so to kind of compensate for that, the researchers behind Source B got clever. Okay. They went out and they found data from other glioblastoma trials where patients had similar characteristics. So they created their own comparison groups. Exactly. Even though those patients weren't actually part of the initial study. Right. That's some serious scientific detective work. A little bit, yeah. Wow. But it was a way to isolate the impact of DC Vexel, even with that crossover. That's really cool. And it allowed them to look at long-term survival data, Okay. which is where things get really exciting. Because we're talking about some patients living for over 10 years. Yeah. That's practically unheard of with glioblastoma. It's remarkable. 10 years is remarkable. Yeah. And it really hints at the possibility that for some patients, this vaccine might not just be a treatment, yeah. but a lifeline. And that's what makes this deep dive so fascinating because we're talking about turning what was essentially a death sentence into a manageable condition. I know. It's incredible. It really is. It's really exciting stuff. You know, it's amazing to think that we might be on the verge of like 
completely changing how we even think about glioblastoma treatment. I know. It's really exciting. I mean, 10 years ago, who would have thought? It's a testament to the progress being made in immunotherapy. Yeah. And what really struck me about Source B was their focus on the bigger picture. Okay. They weren't just looking at survival rates. Right. They delved into quality of life, too. Which is so important. Excellent. Because what's the point of extending life? if those extra years are filled with suffering. Exactly. You want to make sure that people are actually living their lives. Right. And with glioblastoma, you know, one of the major concerns is cognitive function. Mm -hmm. This disease can rob people of their memories, their ability to think clearly, yeah. even their personalities. It's heartbreaking. It's really tough. So how did they even begin to measure something as complex as cognitive function in the context of a clinical trial? Yeah, that's tricky, right? Yeah. Well, they use standardized assessments, okay. kind of like brain puzzles. Oh, interesting. To track things like memory, attention span, problem-solving abilities. Wow. And what did they find? Well, what they found with DCVAXL was really encouraging. Okay. Are you saying that these patients were actually maintaining their cognitive function for longer periods of time? You know, while we can't make definitive conclusions based on a single study, the data definitely suggests that DCVAXL could potentially help preserve those essential cognitive abilities, wow. giving patients more precious time with their loved ones yeah. where they're still fully themselves. Okay, now that's what I'm talking about. Right. That's the kind of breakthrough that gives me goosebumps. It is exciting, and it makes this whole idea of personalized medicine even more yes. exciting and important. You know, yeah. because if we can identify which patients are most likely to benefit from this type of therapy, right. then we can target treatments more effectively. We can potentially improve outcomes and we can minimize unnecessary side effects. And speaking of side effects, yeah, that was another big plus for DC Vaxel, right? Definitely. I mean, traditional chemo and radiation can be brutal. Absolutely. And both study A and source B highlighted the relatively mild side effect profile. Oh, wow. Of these dendritic cell vaccines. So we're talking about a potentially more effective treatment with fewer side effects, exactly. which could have a huge impact on a patient's quality of life during treatment. Absolutely. It's a glimmer of real hope, yeah. you know, yeah. and it speaks to the power of harnessing the body's own immune system to fight this disease. It's like we're finally figuring out how to give our bodies the tools they need to heal themselves. That's the dream, right? Yeah. That's the ultimate goal. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground here. We have. But before we wrap up, I want to touch on one more thing. Okay. In Source B, they mentioned something about identifying biomarkers. Oh, yeah. What's that all about? Ah, uh, yes. So imagine if you could take a sample of a patient's tumor. And analyze it for specific genetic or molecular markers that could tell you how well they're likely to respond to a particular treatment. So it's like a crystal ball. Kind of, yeah. That helps you predict the future of a patient's response to treatment. That's a great way to put it. That's incredible. It's not quite magic. Right. But it's getting close. Yeah. And researchers are working hard to identify these biomarkers. So we're not just talking about, like, making treatment decisions based on, like, you know, age or how far along the cancer is. Right. It's about understanding the tumor at a much deeper level. This could revolutionize how we approach glioblastoma treatment. Absolutely. It would completely change the game. Allowing us to move away from a one-size-fits-all approach exactly. to something truly personalized. That's the future of medicine right there. Okay. So we've been talking about biomarkers, which sound like the key to unlocking this whole new world of personalized medicine for glioblastoma. Yeah. It's like the holy grail, isn't it? Yeah. Being able to look at a patient's tumor and say, okay, this is the best treatment path for you, like based on your unique situation. Right. Because right now it feels like we're still in the early stages trying to figure out which tools work best for which patients. It is. It's like having a toolbox full of amazing tools, but not knowing which one is the right fit for the job, you mm. know? Right. Biomarkers could be that instruction manual we've been missing. And what's so exciting is that Source B actually hinted at some potential biomarkers that could predict how well someone will respond to DC Vaxel. Yeah. It's like they're giving us this sneak peek at the future of this therapy. I know. And this isn't just about DC Vaxel either. Imagine if we could identify biomarkers that could predict a patient's response to ANY type of immunotherapy. Oh, wow. Or even a combination of treatments. 
we're talking about taking all of these incredible breakthroughs we've been discussing, dendritic cell vaccines, mm -hmm. TLR agonists, even CARA T-cell therapy, and yeah. like tailoring them to each individual patient. Exactly. That's okay. the goal, right? Wow. It would completely change the game. Yeah. Shifting our focus from simply fighting the tumor to really optimizing the entire treatment journey for each person. Because it's not just about adding more years to someone's life. Right. It's about adding life to their years, right? It's absolutely. Making sure that those extra years are filled with quality time with their minds and bodies as healthy as possible. Yeah. And I think that's what makes this entire field of research so compelling. Yeah. It's not just about cold, hard science. Mm -hmm. It's about using that science to alleviate suffering and to improve human lives. Yeah in a truly meaningful way. Well said. It feels like we're on the cusp of something truly revolutionary. I think so too. And I, for one, am incredibly hopeful about the future of glioblastoma treatment. As am I. The progress being made is truly remarkable, and while there's still much to learn, the dedication and the ingenuity of these researchers working in this field, it gives me tremendous hope for patients and their families facing this challenging diagnosis. And on that note of hope, we're going to wrap up this deep dive. Yeah. We've covered a lot of ground from the intricate workings of dendritic cell vaccines to the mind-blowing potential of personalized medicine. It's been a wild ride. It has. But most importantly, we hope we've left you with a sense of optimism about the future of glioblastoma treatment. Absolutely. There's so much to be hopeful for. Thank you, as always, for lending your expertise to this conversation. Always a pleasure. And to our listeners, thanks for joining us. Until next time, keep asking questions, keep seeking answers, and keep diving deep.